Melissa Westbrook is the urban forester at the U.S. Capitol Grounds and Arboretum. Melissa manages Arboretum programs, including urban forestry operations, curation of living collections, and plant records. Angela Weber Hetrick is the supervisor of the Gardens and Grounds team at the U.S. Botanic Garden, overseeing the garden's outdoor collections and gardens. And with that, I will turn it over to Angela and Melissa, who are both going to tell us um, just about a few excellent spring blooming trees um, that you as visitors could see on our campuses this spring. So Angela, will, will you tell us a little bit about um, some of the spring blooming trees we can see at the USBG? Great, thank you, uh, thank you, Grace. Um, yes, uh, so everyone, welcome. Uh, I just wanted to highlight some of the trees that you'll be able to find here um, on the grounds of the U.S. Botanic Garden. Uh, the first one is the Higgin Cherry Prunus Subertella. Uh, this is located in Bartoli uh, Fountain and Gardens. Uh, it's an early spring bloomer, gorgeous trees. Um, yeah, please enjoy, come see it. Next slide. The next one is this uh, flowering dogwood, Cornus Florida. Uh, it can be found in the Regional Garden and Bartoli Gardens, and its bloom time is early spring. Another beauty here. Next slide. Uh, next one, we have the pink flowering dogwood, Cornus Florida Rubra, uh, located in the Regional Garden and Bartoli Gardens. The bloom time is early spring. Another stunning one for this season. Next slide. Uh, next, we have the service berry, Amelanchier arborea, uh, located here in the regional garden, and its bloom time is mid-spring. Next slide. Finally, we have the southern magnolia, Magnolia grandiflora, Claudia Wanamaker. Uh, the location of this specific tree is in Bartoli Fountain and Gardens. This usually blooms from mid to late spring, and it's gorgeous, fragrant flowers, too. Next slide. And we have the green hawthorn, Crataegus virtus, winter king. Uh, the location of this specific tree is the regional garden and Bartoli gardens. The bloom time is mid to late spring. Next slide. And finally, we have the eastern redbud, another gorgeous one, Circus canadensis. The location uh, is the regional garden and Bartoli gardens Bartoli Gardens. Um, the bloom time is mid to late spring, another stunning beauty. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much, Angela. And we'll, we'll toss it over to Melissa, who's going to share some highlights um, at the U.S. Capitol Grounds and Arboretum. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Um, just to share a little background about, about the U.S. Capitol Grounds and Arboretum. Um, we're a level three accredited Arboretum comprised of almost 300 acres of, of managed land, um, about 5,000 trees and over 500 woody plant taxa. Uh, and aside from being a, an arboretum, we're also a historic cultural landscape. So I'm gonna discuss um, some of the more abundant and, and more popular uh, spring blooming trees in our landscape. And let's see. Uh, I'm, I'd be remiss, I think, probably if I didn't start the conversation with DC's most iconic spring bloom, flowering cherries. Um, we've got about 30 Prunus taxa in our collection, and I'm going to highlight just um, three of those, starting probably with everyone. Everyone's favorite or most familiar one is the Yoshino cherry. We've got about 230 Yoshino cherries at Capitol Grounds. Um, there's a number of different cultivars as well. Um, it's it's one of the larger cherries growing about 50 feet high. It's got single, single white flowers. Oops, let's go back one. Um, the second one I'm gonna discuss is um, the Kwanzaa. So it comes on um, just after really the, the Yoshino's bloom. It's one of the most popular uh, double flowering cherries. Um, the bloom typically lasts um, quite a bit longer than Yoshino's. It's kind of like an explosion of cotton candy, I always think, in the springtime. Um, and uh, Angela already actually highlighted the, the Hegan cherry, so I'm going to skip that one. But I did want to just share a map with everyone of some of the more prominent locations of, of cherry trees on the grounds. They're still blooming. Yoshino's are actually still blooming. Um, they peaked probably mid last week, but you can still sort of see the remnants of those. 
Um, the Senate parks are um, probably the most concentrated area of Yoshino's that we have, particularly around the Senate reflecting pool. Um, there's also a few prominent groves on the, on the west front of the Capitol that contain several historic trees um, dating to what we think probably is um, that original 1912 gift from Japan. There's also um, a couple really kind of gnarly trunked specimens, I'll say, on the, on the back of the Library of Congress um, Jefferson building that are definitely worth checking out. Uh, next, we have the Magnolia genus, which consists of about 100 different species, um, plus numerous hybrids and cultivars of, of deciduous and evergreen trees and shrubs. Um, at the Capitol Grounds and Arboretum, we have over 25 taxa of magnolia and um, 270 trees in the genera, the vast majority of which are um, southern and sweet bay magnolias, which, as Angela mentioned, bloom kind of early summer, a little bit later on. Um, the first one I, I have here featured is the star magnolia. It's one of the smallest. It's got very showy white flowers that bloom in early spring. Uh, it's been in the trade for a long time. It was uh, originally introduced from Japan in like the 1860s. Um, and today there are, there are many cultivars of it. The saucer magnolia uh, is another very common one that you'll find in our landscapes, particularly around the Capitol building. Uh, it's a hybrid cross between a yulon and a lily. It's got huge cupped flowers that appear in late winter, usually a very welcome sight as spring approaches. Uh, and one of my favorites, the butterfly magnolia, another deciduous hybrid um, that's a, a cross between cucumber magnolia, which is a, a pretty large species, and a yulon that's got these really lovely non-fading yellow blooms that come out in early spring. Um, the next one is a Eastern U.S. native. Um, we do have several Chinese um, species and cultivars in our collection as well, but this is the Americana species. It's, it's very fragrant white flower clusters with these fringy like petals that appear in late spring. It's also got a really wonderful yellow fall color as well. Um, the next one is kind of an old fashioned one, not one of my favorites. It's a small ornamental tree. It's, um, it's been, kind of in cultivation for a very long time, but these particular grouping of trees are, are special in our collection because they're um, a group of memorial trees. Um, Japanese flowering crab apples have this bright pink bud that opens to these very fragrant white flowers mid-spring. Um, the, the cluster here, the memorial trees are dedicated um, to the Sullivan brothers, which were planted in 1952. Uh, one for each of the five brothers was planted. Um, to commemorate their, their service as they lost their lives um, when the USS Juno was sunk in 1942. And I'm gonna leave you with two species that are um, pretty common in our landscape that are kind of blooming a little bit later, maybe early summer, late spring. The first one's the Southern Catalpa. Um, it's also known as a cigar tree, probably for anyone who's seen it. Um, a lot of folks consider it a very weedy tree, but I love it. It gets these, these long, um, seed pods on it that look, look like cigars. Um, the flowers occur in these very showy clusters of about 10 to 20 blossoms on a stem. These um, trumpet-shaped white flowers that have these yellow and purple spots that serve as, as, as nectar guides in the throat of the flower. Uh, you can imagine if you, were, if you were a bumblebee, this flower would look incredibly enticing. Um, they're dual, dual pollinated, which is pretty neat by both bees mostly during the day and then a number of Lepidoptera at night, including um, uh, the Catalpa sphinx moth. So the genera is the, the sole host for that species. And then last is the golden rain tree. Probably many of you know that this is an invasive species in our region. Um, it is planted extensively in urban landscapes because it tolerates a very wide range of really horrible urban environmental conditions. Um, but it does have really beautiful late spring, early summer floral displays of, of these kind of yellow sprays. And then it gets this subsequent um, capsule fruit that kind of looks like a little paper Japanese lantern. Uh, we have quite a few of these in our landscape that haven't been, haven't been phased out yet, um, mostly because they were used in the historic design that was completed um, by Frederick Law Olmsted for the Capitol grounds in uh, between 1874 and 1894. Um, and that is all I have. So Grace, I'm gonna turn it back over to you.
Fabulous. Well, we've already got some questions about spring blooming trees in the chat. So we will just, um, we'll dive right in. Um, and Melissa, I'm going to toss the first question to you because it's about, of course, Yoshino cherries. So this person has a Yoshino cherry in their yard. They've had it in their yard for about 15 years, and it seems to have a green fungus on the trunk for the last eight years, but it is still blooming beautifully. Is there anything this person can do about the fungus? Um, I would be surprised if it was a fungus. I might think that it might be one of two things. So it could be a lichen, which is completely harmless. Um, uh, it, it'll, it'll exist on the tree and really not do it any harm at all. Um, or it could be some kind of algae if it's growing in particularly moist conditions. If your tree otherwise seems very healthy um, and is flowering, then I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> Good to know. And then Angela, I'm going to the next question to you. So this person has a very large oak tree in their front yard. And right now they're growing centipede grass underneath, but it's struggling underneath the oak tree. Could you recommend if folks are thinking of plantings beneath these kind of shady trees, what would you recommend? So it's always hard when you're putting any kind of grass and trees together. Unfortunately, it just it's either one or the other to have the best success rate. Um, yes, if you're gonna do, um, you know, if you love the tree and of course it's staying, I would say, don't worry about the grass. And I would think of some other shade perennials that might actually do much better. You could even just something simple as hostas, so many varieties, hookra, um, just, I would look for shade perennials really. And that would probably just give you a nice look um, as well as the, the perennials would survive and the tree would do fantastic. So I think that would be a great compromise um, if you want something else to kind of, you know, make uh, the planting look really, um, really fantastic. So thanks, Angela. And I'll, um, I'll toss this next one to Melissa. Someone is looking for native spring blooming trees that produce fruit that are attractive to birds. Any recommendations or and Angela, too, if you have any recommendations? Uh, I mean, dogwoods are a great one. They're um, a great food source for a lot of native birds. Um, gosh, I don't know. Um, probably some things like, um, um, I mean, pawpaw is like a very large fruit, probably not great for birds. Um, it has an awesome flower and, and a sole lepidoptera pollinator. Uh, I don't know, Angela. You have you have some thoughts? Um, I was thinking, what about the service berry, Melissa? If I'm trying to remember oh. the fruit on that, yeah, that. Um, might actually do really well for the wildlife and birds and that sort of thing. Um, again, a, a really pretty spring bloomer. Um, so yeah, just kind of, if I'm just remembering the fruit correctly, that might actually um, be a good tree for the wildlife. I will say that a lot of our service berries, they have, um, they get the cedar apple rust. And so mm, a lot of folks right. who are growing up, you're gonna notice that like your your fruits start to look like these weird little orange alien spikes are coming out of them in the spring. That's true. Um, <laughs> So the ones that don't get hit by that are definitely fair game for wildlife. <laughs> Thank you. We've got lots of great questions coming in. So I'm going to toss this one um, to Angela. This person has noticed um, that the red buds flower on their trunk and that they develop fewer buds in the older parts of the tree. Um, and so does blooming stay uniform on a red bud as it gets older in your uh, experience? Um, I'm going to say probably no. I mean, as the tree ages, you know, it's going to bloom. Um, you know, it's kind of going to go through cycles. I mean, some years it's going to do better than others. And really a lot of sometimes how a tree does, it really can depend on the year prior, how much water, how much nutrients, things like that. So sometimes what you see in one season may be affected from actually a previous year's um, conditions, environmental conditions. So really that's something to think about depending upon the age of the tree um, and just how healthy it is. If it's starting to decline, if you see that year and year and year again, then maybe it's like, okay, maybe the tree's declining. But if you, if it's a one-off, maybe I wouldn't be too concerned. So just keep an eye on it from year to year and that the tree's, you know, um, looking healthy. Thanks, Angela. And I'm going to toss this one um, to Melissa. Someone is looking to support native pollinators in their yard. Uh, can you recommend any, um, any spring blooming trees that would help do that? Um, yeah, I mean, there's tons of them. Um, 
if you want to support insect life and you have space for it, like um, a lot of the smaller showy ornamental things are not going to be actually supporting as, as much um, insect life as something like an oak. So uh, if you've got space for it, I'd say plant, plant a big shade tree like an oak. Um, so those are good. Um, uh, like I mentioned, a number of, if you're trying to attract a specific species, you could look at like host specific relationships. So think about a, a pawpaw or like I mentioned, a catalpa. Um, really just depends on what you're trying to attract. Um, also, I'm a huge fan of, of witch hazels, which um, is an early, early food source um, for a lot of insects um, and just a really nice like out of color in, in winter, which I think we all need sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've got someone who has, and I'll toss this one to Angela. Someone has a pink dogwood that has bloomed beautifully for the past five years, but this year does not have any buds. Um, any ideas on what could be going on? Um, I guess it depends where you're um, located in the country. So it still could be a little early yet, just depending. Um, our weather here in the D.C. area has been a little erratic. We had 80 degree temperatures in February, um, not normal. Um, so it could be still slightly early if you're um, a local to the area. Um, I wouldn't be too concerned yet. Um, I would, If you don't see anything by late April, um, early May, I would certainly be concerned. And check the health. You could always check the green of the bark and that sort of thing. Just make sure is your tree still alive, that sort of thing. Um, so do some periodic health checks on your uh, trees as well. I've got a little bit of a follow-up question, which is how does one do a health check on a tree? Well, there's lots of things you can look at. Look at the bark. Um, you can start to see if you see any leaves or buds starting to emerge. You can just kind of look at the overall health of the tree. If it looks like, does it look, you know, um, vibrant? Does it look, you know, kind of in years past when you first um, acquired the tree? Kind of do some comparisons. Um, also, take some pictures and send it to your extension agents if you're uh, really concerned or even sometimes a a fresh sample is always a good way. Like, hey, is there any kind of insect issues going on? Um, is there something else I should be concerned about? Any kind of diseases? So um, certainly, you know, if the tree is looking, if there's good green growth, there's um, the bark looks healthy. So you want to be looking at all those things, making sure there's not some kind of weird insects growing now on the tree. So kind of do those check-ins with your plants as well. Um, you know, in each season, you'll see different things and you'll observe new things as well. Thanks, Angela. Uh, I'm going to toss this one over to Melissa. Someone is looking for cherry or magnolia varieties that do well in partial shade. Any recommendations? Uh, there are tons of magnolias that do really well in shade. Um, a lot of the like very showy, like um, Yulon and, and Lily magnolias are probably not going to do well. Um, but things that are um, uh, crosses between like some of our native species. Um, um, Umbrella magnolia is one of my favorites. It's kind of a more um, more shrubby small tree, um, but it does really well in deep shade and it has these massive leaves on it that are just really cool, very tropical looking. Um, cucumber magnolia is another one. So if you look at like that butterflies cross that I shared, that one does okay in a little bit more shade. Um, Maybe some sweet bay magnolias would do okay in a little bit more shade. Um, just kind of depends. Uh, and then cherries, um, probably some of the more native cherries, I would say. Um, cher everything in the prunus really like tends to like a lot of sun, I think, in general. Um, but maybe like a, a prunus virginiana might do kind of okay. It's it's kind of a more understory, and it, it's actually really great for pollinators as well, um, and does is a good food source for for birds too. Awesome, thank you, Melissa. And this is for both Angela and Melissa. Which does either the USBG or um, US Capital Grounds and Arboretum? Do we have any pawpaws um, on either of our campuses? If I remember, so yeah. Yes. Uh, yep. Here in the regional garden. We do have a few. We're actually starting to plant a lot more over in the Senate Parks area. Um, not to like send people across the street, but the Smithsonian American, uh, you can see it in the background of, of Angela's picture, uh, Museum of the American Indian has a really great collection of pawpaws. Um, and if you time it just right, you can probably get over there when the fruit's on and snag a couple. <laughs> 
Good to know. I'm going to be sneaking over there late summer. Yeah. Um, Angela, we've got someone who's looking to um, plant some native trees in containers on their patio. Are there any native trees that might do well in a container that could potentially support pollinators? Um, I'm just concerned in a container, um, just, you know, as trees get very, you know, as they grow and get large, they're going to become root bound. Um, so uh, I would kind of probably steer away from containers just, you know, for the health of the tree, they're going to get root bound. They're going to, maybe roots might start girdling, that sort of thing. So um, maybe not the best idea for trees in a container. Um, I would honestly, at that point, look at some uh, like patio citrus or something else that, you know, maybe just something that might do a little bit better in a container versus, you know, uh, large native trees, um, just because ideally they want to be in the ground. They want to be outside. <laughs> um, so I think that's probably best. Thank you. Um, I'm going to toss this one over to Melissa. Um, we've got someone who's and it's totally fine if this is a mystery to us, but someone living in South Florida, uh, zone 10B, and they're just wondering if any of these trees that we're talking about today um, could do well down in zone 10B. I, sure, I could uh, chime in there. I lived down in that part of Florida at one point in my life. Um, so yeah, actually, so um, Southern Magnolia uh, would probably do okay down there. I know it grows in many parts of Florida, um, but many of these other ones, their threshold is like zone nine, which is more like Northern Florida. So um, I think some of these others, you're looking at zones five, four through nine, but pushing that Southern Florida, you're looking at that 10 range, Southern Magnolia is probably your best bet. Awesome, thank you, Angela. Um, let's see here. Um, I'm going to toss this one over to Melissa. This person lives in DC. Um, is there a cherry tree that could tolerate the public street box, street tree box areas? Um, I mean, I would, I wouldn't recommend this, but I, I think Yoshino's and Kwanzaa's would tolerate it. I mean, just think about how compacted the soil is down around the tidal basin. Uh, if that's really what we're looking at, then I, I mean, by all accounts, they're pretty tough trees. Um, so yeah, I would recommend one of those. Um, probably not some of the native cherries, I would think like a um, like black cherry, I wouldn't recommend. Um, so yeah, give it a shot. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm gonna toss this one over to Angela, which is kind of connected to this, which is, is there a rule of thumb for distance between planting flowering trees and shrubs like red buds and service berries? Um, you definitely, so you want to consider the tree you're planting and um, how much space it's going to need, you know, how large it's going to get. Uh, if you need to do some research, um, you know, whether it's through your extension or, um, you know, uh, emailing us here on the BG hotline, if you're like, hey, do I need to, you know, look at 10 feet between my trees? Do I need to look at 20? What's the long-term goal and where is the tree going? How close to a home? That sort of thing. You want to keep all those things in mind. Um, but, you know, some trees can grow to be 120 feet tall and maybe you need about, you know, 10 feet space between the next tree. So depending, you just got to look at what um, what specific trees and shrubs you're using and kind of look at the, the span, the width, the height, all those things and what else is going in that planting or around there. So really getting all your dimensions and then giving plenty of space if you're planting something rather large. So it's good to do your measurements. Awesome. Thank you, Angela. Um, and Melissa, I'm going to toss this one over to you. There's someone in the DMV area. They are looking for native fruit or nut trees that could go in a front yard with full sun, and they are hoping not to attract deer. So lots of stipulations. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Good luck with that, I will say. Uh, if you're anywhere adjacent to Rock Creek Park, um, you're probably going to get them no matter what you do. Um, gosh, there's so many good good, um, good native fruit and nut trees that you could use. Um, um, any number of hickories would be great. Um, walnuts, although you have to think about like what else you're planting there because walnuts, you know, exude their allelopathic. So, um, a, a, only a certain other number of species will, will tolerate that chemical that they exude. Um, pawpaws are a great one. I don't often see deer browsing on those. Um, 
but I think it's worth saying if you're really committed to like um, to growing a number of native fruit or nut trees in your yard, like pick something that maybe you like and that's going to work in your yard and just protect it until it gets big enough that the deer aren't going to browse on it or or um, you know when they're felting they're rubbing their antlers on the stems so just protect them during that season as well. Thank you. Um, Angela, I'll toss this one to you. This person has a Lady Jane Magnolia and they're saying it looks more like a shrub than a tree and they're wondering if they should prune the side branches to make it more tree shaped. Um, depending upon the age of the tree, I would leave it alone until you have a good sense of the age of the tree and what kind of um, how you want the tree to look aesthetically. But if it's pretty young, I would say leave it alone um, and then wait and do your pruning till you know, you can see some nice shape and form to the tree. And then as there's lower branches that need to come off, do that gradually and in stages. Uh, don't be too abrupt when trees are young. You, you want to um, you want them to be nice, stop, get, you know, get very established. You want them to grow um, healthy and strong. So I would say before you do any major pruning, um, definitely get that tree nicely established um, and then, you know, take off a little bit at a time. If I may add to that's like great points about um, training, but like Jane Magnolia is a it's a small magnolia and that's just kind of its habit too. it kind of spreads out a lot. So um, as you're selecting, you know, what trees you want to grow in your landscape, really think about like that final form and its natural habit, because you don't want to have to like, you know, force a, a, a square square peg into a round hole or whatever. So um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful tree, but it is kind of a smaller, squat, shrubbier looking tree. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, I'll toss this one to uh, Melissa. Let's see, this person has a maple tree um, that has buds coming out in a few weeks, but now it looks like the buds are almost gone. They're very shriveled up and they're wondering what's going to happen. Um, good question. I wonder what kind of magnolia it is, uh, or I'm sorry, what kind of maple it is. Um, so we would have just seen um, red red maples kind of blooming and they're doing their fruit set right now. Um, I just give it some time, wait and see what happens. There, there are a few diseases that impact maples that could be at play, something like anthracnose. I wouldn't worry too much. I'd kind of just wait and see what happens, um, wait and see if it leaves out. Um, and if you feel like you have other concerns, you can always reach out to a, a, your local extension agent as well. Thank you. Um, and connecting to what you were saying earlier, Angela, someone is wondering if you have any pruning recommendations to optimize health and optimize flowering for some of these spring blooming trees. Um, yeah, so certainly it's always best with um, any trees. You always want to take out the dead or the dying wood of any tree. Um, you know, so that's always, so yeah, you want to eliminate all that. So that doesn't harbor any kind of pests or disease or anything like that. So that's always get out your, um, your dead wood on the trees. Um, and then really, you know, making sure you've given the tree plenty of space, um, whether it's in your yard or wherever, lots of airflow, and then taking out maybe, um, small branches and limbs that, maybe are getting too low or that maybe are crossing. So kind of, you know, always take a step back when you're um, deciding on what to prune. You know, it's also, it's an art form. So you wanna make sure you're getting the tree, you want it to be healthy, but you also want it to give it very correct form and shape. Um, so those are all things that you can look at and always, you know, have a second look. Don't always maybe prune everything in the same day. Maybe go back a week later and really take a look at like, okay, all right, how does this look? And really, you know, think about it as an art form and, but just keeping the tree healthy to eliminate all the dead and dying wood. Thank you, Angela. Um, we've got another Yoshino question. So I'm gonna to toss this to Melissa. This person has a 15 year old Yoshino cherry uh, and they're worried about the roots causing issues with their home's foundation. Uh, they called an arborist who said that the, they could trim the crown if they're concerned about the roots, but they're not sure why trimming the crown um, might help with the roots. So they're looking for some help. Sure. Um so again, this goes just to start off, right? Like right, right plant, right place. <laughs> Yoshino cherries um, tend to have like a lot of surface roots. Um, so if that's a concern that you're worried about, um, you know, think about putting a different species if it's close to your home. Um, 
in terms of like managing the crown to root ratio, so sometimes reducing crown can also um, reduce the need for the tree to kind of put out more fibrous root systems. So that could be one aim that the arborist is looking at. Um, if, if it looks like you're really worried about it, you could always ask an arborist to come in with a specialized tool called an, an air spade and they can air excavate around the roots and kind of identify if there are problematic roots um, and if any of them could be pruned if they're not structural roots. Um, the other thing you can look at doing is putting in a type of root barrier. So um, they come in lots of different types of product um, products. A lot of them are just a poly material that you could probably slide in near your foundation that would really prevent roots from infiltrating your foundation as well. So just a couple recommendations there. Thank you. Um, I'm going to toss this one. Uh, we'll start with Angela, but you both might have recommendations for this person. Someone is looking for under understory trees that they could plant near a loblolly pine and they live in Delaware. Hmm. Um, gosh, um, okay, Delaware, I'm trying to think of understory trees. Um, gosh, Melissa, I'm going to toss this over to you. I just can't think of anything off the top of my head right now. Um, uh, Delaware. <laughs> uh, pr probably uh, Cornus would do okay, so some dogwoods would do okay. Um, if you're not stuck on just trees, there's a lot of really great understory shrub material that's kind of larger. So you could look at some viburnums that might be trained into smaller trees. Um, you could look at potentially, if you're kind of coastal Delaware, um, some, some wax myrtles or something like that. Um, there's a number of different ilex species that would probably work that are native. Um, great for pollinators as well. Um, yeah. It, it, I, I would also say if it's growing near a loblolly, you must be kind of more coastal um, or have some sandy soil. So think think about the right plants for like your soil conditions as well as your weather. Thank you both. Um, I'll start with I'll start with Angela on this question, but we'll see um, if you both want to weigh in. This person has a 30 year old cherry tree. It puts out a lot of suckers. Um, is there any um, should they remove the suckers? Should they allow those suckers to replace the mature tree? It seems like their 30 year old tree is starting to decline. So they're wondering what they should do with these suckers. Um Grace, my natural just uh, gut instinct is to just, you know, keep pruning the suckers. Um, the 30 year old tree, I mean, uh, I, I, if it's as long as it's in good health, I think they shouldn't worry. They think it's starting to decline. Was that the second part? Hmm. Um, yeah, my gut feeling is just to keep pruning the uh, suckers um, and maybe think about even in a uh, different tree once that one totally declines. Maybe just thinking about like, I don't know, if, um, you know, just think about something else that would replace it in the future. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna toss this next question to Melissa. This person lives in Southeast Michigan and they have some crab apple trees um, that tend to sucker and they're wondering if there are any more varieties that might be more well behaved. Um, well, I guess first I would ask what the the trees that they have are. Um, there are a lot of crab apples. They, they just do kind of tend to sucker. That's kind of in their nature. Um, if you're not totally attached to the crab apples, um, I would recommend maybe hawthorns. They're like really great, um, more northern acclimated, tons of great species, um, really great for pollinators. Uh, and they do get they do get that kind of like similar little crab apple fruit on them. Um, uh, but I, I can't think of any like cultivars off the top of my head that don't sucker as much as like the, the floribundas do. Thanks, Melissa. Um, I'll toss this next one to Angela. This person is looking for suggestions for a privacy barrier that would be a native plant and potentially also edible. Any, any thoughts? Hmm. Okay, so edible, um, barrier, um, native. Gosh, um, I mean, well, I don't know how much of a privacy kind of barrier thing you're looking for. I mean, the uh, Circus canadensis, beautiful, but uh, no, no fruit. Um, 
gosh, I'm trying to, um, edible for wildlife or humans? Great question. <laughs> that, was, that was not specified. No, right. I'm thinking like, okay, or we, we could do service berry, but no, um, I'm just trying to think what would really give you all the, all the things. Um, I'm, yeah. Hmm. I'd have to think on that one a little bit more. Um, I, I know that a lot of, of your folks in Europe use things like Coriolis um, or hazelnuts um, as like fencing barriers. So I don't, I don't know how great it would be at screening out neighbors that are deciduous. So you're like, you're not going to get like a real barrier. Uh, maybe consider like layering different species. So stick some evergreens in there mixed with other species. Um, but but uh, hazelnuts are, are a great one to use. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. And I think we will also share, um, we've got a plant hotline at the USBG. Um, so if you ever want to um, email our gardeners and our horticulturists, you can, and it gives them a little chance to do some research and, and get back to you all. So we'll pop that in the chat as well. Um, thank you both. Let's see, we've got another question here. I'm going to toss this one um, to Melissa. This one, this person is wondering, is there a Western red cedar um, or is a Western red cedar a good idea for the mid-Atlantic region? They have a small yard, um, but they got this plant as a gift. And so they're wondering if they should plant it in their yard. Um, I mean, plant it, why not? And just kind of see what happens. Um, <laughs> I, if you're like really looking for it to like to thrive, maybe probably not like here. It's, it's Pacific Northwest, I think, if I'm correct on that. Um, we have a couple species in our grounds that are like absolutely should not be here, including uh, uh, giant redwoods. Like I can't think of a worse place to plant a redwood than in Washington, D.C. And it, they struggle. They really struggle. So uh, the fact that they've been alive for um, the 80 years now probably is our oldest one is, is probably a testament to the species more than anything. But um, um, you can always give it a shot and see how it goes. <laughs> think, think, really think about how you like the right, uh, like environment for it to be planted. Um, even like the right micro environment, if you can, right. Like think about the right soils and not sticking it maybe too close to, to a building and things like that. So thank you, Melissa. Um, I'm going to toss this next one to Angela. Um, this person has a red, a red bud that they've been growing from a cutting since 2020. It has grown well, but it has not yet flowered. When can they expect a young red bud to start flowering? Oh, gosh. Um, OK, so it's only been growing. I'm, ass I'm assuming it's still pretty small. Um, I would say probably maybe by year five. So if it's still, if it's just from a cutting, you've got at least, I mean, you've got a ways to go yet. So um, definitely, you know, getting the tree established, but it's going to, I think it's going to be some time yet. So give it a couple years and a couple seasons. Good to know. Thank you. Um, Melissa or Angela, any recommendations for spring blooming trees for zone three? Zone three. No, chilly. I'm trying to remember when when sorbus like mountain ash blooms that's like a really great tree that i wish we could grow down here and we just can't <laughs> um zone three is chilly yeah i don't know uh, probably some hawthorns would be good up there probably some other crab apples um i don't know angela might have other ideas although it sounds like you come from the south so <laughs> no no i'm born and raised actually mid-atlantic but i uh, spent some okay. time uh, in florida <laughs> but yeah zone three uh oh. Yeah, zone four, pretty much, I think the coldest we uh, touched on today was really zone four. Um, did they give a specific location for their zone three, um, Grace? We do not have a specific okay. location, but um, we I'll, I'll send them to the plant hotline. I'll okay. pop that, we'll pop that in the chat um, once again. Yeah, so thank you both for, for noodling on that one. Um, I'll send the next question. Um, to Angela, this person is looking to plant um, a viburnum prunifolium in part shade, and they're wondering if that's a good idea. Um, yes, I think it should be all right. Um, generally, viburnums do like a lot of sun, um, but if it's getting probably you know at least six hours of sunlight during the day, I think you 
should be fine. Um, and really, so when things um, are more in shade, maybe you might not get as heavy of blooms. So just kind of be mindful of that. If all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's not blooming as much as I thought it would. Maybe it's about, you know, it's just not getting enough sun. So think about those kinds of things. Thank you. Um, I'll toss this next one to Melissa. Someone is just wondering, are there any uh, considerations that they have to make when planting trees on a hillside and what trees will, will do well? Good question. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I would think about like how steep the slope is. Um, I'm like always terrified of, of things that are going to be like have, have loading factors in, in off seasons and ends. So things like pines would maybe worry me a little bit. Um, certainly when you're planting it, you're gonna have to think about how it's being oriented in its planting location. Um, that's the biggest thing. And you, we typically don't like to stake a lot of our trees when we plant them um, because you want the tree to be able to, to flex. And as it grows, it's, it's gonna, um, kind of have an, a natural adapted ability um, to move with wind and things. Um, but in this case, I think probably on a hillside, you want to make sure you're staking at least for like the first year or so and then remove those stakes. Um, in terms of species, I mean, I, I I don't think there's any real red flags other than what I mentioned, like um, thinking about loading factors. But I think like, if it's a shade tree, any like kind of native oak, Nissa sort of thing would do fine. Um, and probably any number of small trees would be fine. I don't know. Angela, do you have thoughts? <laughs> All right, not, not at the moment. I think those are some great recommendations. So thank you both. Um, let's see, we've got, uh, I'm gonna toss this, kind of open it up to both of you. This person has is wondering if they should replace the non-native plants in their landscape with natives over time. They've got a lot of forsythia in their yard that they enjoy, and they're wondering if they should slowly replace it with witch hazel or something similar. Um, sure. So I think it really just kind of depends. I mean, native is great and it, you know, provides a great food source for the wildlife, the habitat. Um, so it's really depending upon what you're going for. It's a, it's a great idea if you have the space and the room. Um, but certainly it never, it never could hurt. Yeah. I mean, I would just echo what Angela says. I don't, I'm not like an extreme nativist. So I, there's like a number of, of trees, like a Prunus mume. Uh, the, the USBG has some really awesome Prunus mume in their yard. I have a couple in my yard and I like the pollinators go nuts for them on warm days in late winter. Um, and they're just beautiful. And they put on this fruit that makes like the most delicious pickled thing that you've ever had. Um, so I, you know, Grow what you like um, is how I feel about it. Something that's going to make you happy. <laughs> well, thank you both. I will uh, leave one last question for you, which is uh, on your respective campuses, what tree are you most looking forward um, to blooming in this uh, spring season? Um, gosh, for me, I mean, it's kind of one of them is right behind me, uh, the Circus Canadensis. I mean, I just love the colors. I love that they're a small, smaller tree that I could even plant in my own backyard. Um, so, yeah, I just, you know, between the red buds, the cherries, um, I mean, I don't know, all of it. It's, it's kind of hard to decide, really. I mean, they all have their different traits that I love, so. Yeah, I, th I think I like told myself already, um, the Prunus Mume is one of my favorites because um, it, it blooms so early and I'm just always like, ah, finally. <laughs> um, also the uh, Ozark Witch Hazel, uh, Vernalis, I think is the species. It's kind of a smaller shrubby looking thing, um, but it's, it's really beautiful and I love when it blooms. Um, I will say that one of my favorite things that we don't grow um, is a, a button bush or button tree. If you go to like Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens, you'll see them everywhere. It's just like the coolest looking like little ball of white bloom that's so fun. And it's it's a summer bloomer. So it's kind of nice to see a little bit later as well. Well, thank you both so much for joining us today. And thank you to everyone who attended.